Howdy folks, and welcome back to War Thunder with the Mighty Jingles. It's been about a week since I put a War Thunder video up. Um, I have been busy this week though, setting up the new PC, putting all the furniture together for the man cave, but yeah, it's all done. Normal service should now be resumed. So what's going on here? Oh no. I've spawned in a bomber, and it's an arcade domination match. Well, this seems pretty pointless. Or is it? It is a bit of a lottery when you hit that random battle button and you've got bombers in your lineups. Bombers on domination matches? Well, they're not completely pointless, there is stuff for them to do. There are some ground targets there, to give the bombers something to keep them occupied while they're being farmed for kills by all the enemy fighters. And a lot of people will see a domination match pop up. Half their lineup consists of bombers and they just think, oh, great. But you know what? Don't think of it as a disappointment. Think of it as a challenge, particularly if you've got some fast bombers like the JU-88 or the Year 2 or the Spaviero S-79. Because your bomber can take a few more hits than a fighter and nothing rustles the jimmies of the enemy team more in a domination match than if you sneak in and ninja their home airfield from them right at the beginning of the match. And a fast bomber like the JU-88 is absolutely perfect for it. Yeah, you're probably going to lose your bomber, but you're in a domination match in a bomber. You're going to lose your bomber anyway. At least this way, you get to do something funny with it. There we go. Now all your baser belong to us. <laughs> and there's, there's not a lot that demoralises a team more than two minutes into the start of the game, and they've already lost all three bases. <laughs> totally worth it. Speaking of versatile aircraft, I think I'm really enjoying this thing. This is the uh, Aichi B7A2. It's a Japanese carrier-based dive bomber and torpedo bomber. And as far as dive and torpedo bombers go with the Japanese, until now the only thing you've had to play with is the Nakajima Kate, the B5N, which was pretty terrible. Uh, aside from its airdropped ordnance, you know, the torpedo or the bombs, it only had a tail gunner. There were no forward-firing guns on the thing. This thing, oh, oh yeah, this has two... 20mm cannons mounted in the wings. And because it can spawn at bomber altitude, it's an incredibly effective bomber hunter. You get to rake them with cannon fire from your 20mm as you approach, and then if you pull up afterwards, your tail gunner gives them the good news as well. Gonna let that guy go, because there's a welcome committee waiting for him behind me, and there's an IL-4 up here, who's just about coming into shooting range. Come on. Oh, engine on fire, good stuff. And while this thing is an attack aircraft, it handles... Well, it's not like flying a fighter. Not quite. That fire's eating him up. I'm not going to dive down on him, he's probably finished. Come on. Burn, bitch. Yeah, got him. Now, while I haven't flown the G8 Renzen yet, I have unlocked it, but I've never actually played it. So bearing that in mind, at the moment, this thing right here is my favourite Japanese bomber. Most Japanese bombers get a pretty weedy bomb load, and the biggest thing this thing can carry is a single 800 kilo bomb. And that's a pretty big bomb. You know, it's 800 kilos, not 800 pounds. That's a substantial amount of bang. And this thing is a dive bomber. It's not a high altitude, heavy or medium bomber. So that means that it's precise. It tends to hit what you drop the bomb on. And anybody getting hit by 800 kilograms of high explosive tends to have a pretty bad day. Nice, tightly packed groups of landing craft like this, for example. Well, it does seem like a bit of a waste to use an 800 kilo bomb on them. <laughs> but it's only going to slow me down, and there are enemy fighters on my tail. And what you don't hit with a bomb, you've got two 20mm cannons in the front of this thing. See, unlike the B5N, once your bomb's gone, you're not completely useless. And also, unlike the B5N, 
This thing's quick. So you're not completely at the mercy of enemy fighters when you pull out of your dive. You've got the speed to open up, separate the distance, turn around and then come back and attack the fighters that are chasing you. I really, really do like this aircraft. And it's only rank 3. Just, you know, don't get too carried away. This thing is pretty manoeuvrable for a, an attack aircraft, but it is not a fighter. You really, really do need to give yourself plenty of time to break. Yeah, more than that. <laughs> well, I got the kill anyway. So what's this thing like in realistic battles? You know, it's it's not bad. You probably don't want to be using the 800 kilo bomb if you're on a realistic battle because you get to kill one target and you need to do better than that. It can carry up to 10 60 kilo bombs, which is pretty shit. I mean, what can you do with a 60 kilo bomb? You can take out light tanks and armored cars, use a couple of them to take out a light pillbox, and that's pretty much it. The intermediate bomb load also includes a couple of 250 kilo bombs at the cost of a bunch of your 60 kilos. But you are an attack aircraft, you're not a heavy bomber, and so you should really be going for things like artillery positions, uh, lightly armoured vehicle convoys, things like that, and leaving the tough targets like the heavy tanks, the heavy pillboxes, to your proper bombers. And so you're probably end up, you're going to end up getting most of your kills with your two 20mm cannons rather than with your bomb load, especially if you suck at bombing in realistic like I do. The Japanese never built many of these aircraft, only 111 in total. Nine B7A1s and 105 B7A2s. And the reason they didn't build a lot of these aircraft wasn't because they weren't any good. It was because they were designed to operate from larger aircraft carriers than the Japanese actually had. It was designed to replace the existing in-service torpedo and dive bombs that the Imperial Japanese Navy had in 1941, and it was designed to be operated from the new Taiho-class aircraft carriers. Now, in 1941 the Japanese didn't have any Taiho-class aircraft carriers, only one of them had been laid down, and it was still in construction at the time of Pearl Harbor. The difference between the existing fleet carriers that the Japanese had in 1941 and the Taihos was principally down, as far as the B7A2 was concerned, to the size of the hangar elevators. The existing Japanese fleet carriers, the elevators that took the aircraft from the hangar to the flight deck, were not big enough to fit a B7A2 on, so these things could not operate from existing Japanese aircraft carriers. And that was going to prove to be a significant problem. The Taiho class aircraft carriers were essentially just larger, more heavily armoured, modified versions of the existing Shikaku class fleet carriers. Unfortunately for Japan, and this was a problem that was going to plague them throughout the entire course of the Second World War, was that they had severely underestimated both the US Navy's ability to kill their existing aircraft carriers and the US Navy submarine service's capability to effectively blockade Japan from all of the resources that they need to build their new aircraft and their new carriers. Japan was in control of a huge empire in Eastern Asia. They'd been fighting in China since the early 1930s. They'd occupied almost all of the old Dutch, French and British colonies in the Far East. Their empire had almost unlimited amounts of natural resources to call upon. The only problem was they couldn't get any of it to Japan thanks to the US Navy submarine blockade. The US Navy's submarine service doesn't get a fraction of the credit that it deserves for what it achieved in the war against Japan in the Pacific. Everybody knows about the Battle of Midway, the Battle of the Philippines, the Battle of the Coral Sea, um, the invasion of Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, you know, and these were all important military operations, but one of the main reasons that they were so successful was because Japan was starved of the ability to construct new aircraft carriers to replace the losses that they were taking in these battles. Because while the carrier fleet and the US Air Force were making all the headlines, quietly, with very little fuss, and at a fraction of the cost that was lavished, for example, on the B-29 Superfortress project, the US Navy Submarine Service 
was strangling Japan's ability not only to resupply and reinforce the garrisons of the island bases that the US Marines and the US Navy were conquering, but they were also knocking out any chance that Japan had of replacing the carrier and battleship and cruiser and merchantman losses that they'd been suffering throughout the course of the war from 1941 onwards. And this was disastrous news for the B-7A2 because it meant that Japan only ever had one aircraft carrier that this thing could actually operate from. And that was sunk in the Battle of the Philippines. And in a stroke of irony, whereas the Shikaku-class fleet carriers that the Taiho was based on often sustained multiple bomb and torpedo hits before sinking, the Taiho, which was much more heavily armoured and designed to withstand multiple bomb and torpedo hits, was sunk after being hit by one torpedo from an American submarine, the USS Albacore. To add insult to injury, at the time she was sunk, she wasn't even operating any B-7As. She was still crewed with all of the older aircraft, the Judys, the Jills and the Zeros, that the Chicago-class carriers could operate anyway. So the Taiho ended up being nothing more than a very, very expensive waste of time. And one of the reasons why she wasn't operating B-7As at the time of the Battle of the Philippines was to do with the design of the B-7As. As a much bigger and heavier dive bomber or torpedo bomber than was currently in service with the Imperial Japanese Navy, she needed a new power plant, and the engine that she used was experimental. A combination of problems with the airframe, coupled with teething problems with the new engine, meant that it was almost two years before the B-7A2 was even ordered into production as the Navy Carrier Attack Bomber Shooting Star, or the Aichi B-7A2. Aside from nine prototype B-7A1s, only 80 of these aircraft were completed by Aichi before its factory was destroyed in an earthquake in May 1945. And by the time these aircraft actually entered service, when they were allocated to the Allied codename Grace, the Japanese Navy no longer had any carriers from which they could operate. So they only saw limited service from land bases. So all of this was terrible news for Japan, but fantastic news for the US Navy, because the B-7A2 was a very, very capable aircraft. Despite being a bigger and heavier aircraft than its predecessors, it could carry the same bomb load and had the performance characteristics of the A6M Zero. The wings were designed with extendable ailerons, which effectively allowed them to act as flaps, which is what made this thing so manoeuvrable and allowed it to actually dogfight up there with the A6M Zero. Just imagine for a minute what the consequences would have been if this aircraft had actually made it into service in sufficient numbers on the new generation of Japanese aircraft carriers. They had a service range of 1,888 miles, so for all practical intents and purposes, that meant that these things could be launched from their aircraft carriers to strike targets 900 miles away and return. Of course, if you're going to strike targets that far away from your carrier, you're not going to be able to fly with a fighter escort because the Zero didn't have the range to keep up with them. But they didn't need a fighter escort. These things handled like the A6M20. And unlike the dive bombers and torpedo bombers that they replaced, they were armed with two Type 99 20mm cannons. They could be their own fighter escort. All of which is a rather long-winded way of saying that America probably owes a bigger debt than it realises to the unsung heroes of the US Navy submarine service during the course of the Second World War. Here in War Thunder, it's an incredibly enjoyable aircraft to fly, and it's a real revelation after playing the existing Japanese dive and torpedo bombers. In arcade, it handles pretty much like a fighter. It carries a whopping great big bomb, which is more than sufficient for taking out hardened targets. Load the 20mm cannons up with armor-piercing ammunition, and they're more than good enough for dealing with targets like light tanks, armored cars, and if you're a good shot and you attack from the right angle, medium and sometimes heavy tanks as well. In realistic battles, while I freely acknowledge I am far from being an expert at flying realistic battles, I have been doing consistently well in the B7A2. The 20mm cannons are really this thing's primary weapon. Obviously in realistic you want to get one bomb load, and then you have to return to your airbase. And 60 kilo bombs, unless you're very, very good at bombing, well, the kind of targets that you can knock out with a 60 kilo bomb, you can kill with your 20 millimeter cannons anyway. And I'm finding that if there's a bunch of B7A2s and a bunch of medium and heavy bombers flying the same battle, the B7A2s always survive longer. And they survive longer 
because this thing is able to evade its pursuers and often turn the tables on them just when they least expect it thanks to the excellent performance and handling characteristics. So if you've been going down the Japanese dive and torpedo bomber line and despairing at just how awful the initial aircraft are and they really are pretty terrible, well, you've got this to look forward to. Unfortunately, this is as good as it gets. Here at rank 3, the B7A2 is the last Japanese dive and torpedo bomber that's in the game, at least for now. But it's a hell of an aircraft, and I've had a hell of a time flying it. As always, folks, watch your six, and I'll catch you next time.